And we should be recording. Can anybody get the indication that we're recording? Yep, we can see the recording. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, cool. Well, welcome to the fourth content routing work group. Um, we've made a ton of progress, but we have a lot more folks here this time. Thanks to everybody coming back from uh, Switzerland. That was a really productive trip. It kind of coincided with our last meeting. Um, but uh, I shared the uh, notes in meeting chat. We've got some agenda items. Um, we did a little talking after the last meeting and concluded that it would be beneficial if we just had each group that participates in this meeting do a brief kind of general high level update of progress they've made on their team since the last meeting, since each of these teams has such a broad coverage and it's all pretty much relevant to the content routing aspects of the work that everybody's doing. Um, but um, I put in our notes uh, kind of um, an update area for kind of folks that wanted to drop stuff in here. Not in any particular order, but um, IPFS folks, would you indulge us in just such an update? You, or if, uh, you okay take that, Gus? Uh, I I can update some of it. I, I'm actually not like fully up to speed on where we are with the release. Um, the Kubo release is out. It is out? Okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, in terms okay, of its so, deployment, uh, it's not deployed everywhere in Bifrost, uh, but the the release itself is is completed. Okay, so that's the release that turns on sid.contact by default uh, in in Kubo as a content router. Uh, so that that's been released now. I can go close a bunch of issues now. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and other than that. Um, I've opened up that uh, it's still a work in progress, but I'm adding streaming support to the, which is the indie JSON content type to the uh, delegated routing implementation that we have in libIPFS. Um, this is to support other kinds of delegated routing. Like if we want to delegate to the DHT or something like that, uh, where we care about getting the first result back before the rest of them, because uh, it could take a while to come back. Um, and real quick, Gus, is that gonna is that a, is there a spec change needed for that? There will be, yeah. I'm in, I'm like doing the implementation first, and then I'll I'll open up a spec spec change for it. It'll be a new IPIP. Cool. And then I guess IPIP three three seven, the main one, that can now get uh that can get merged. Is it ready to get merged? Uh, I'll go. Yeah, I need to go. There's I've, there's been some chatter in it that I haven't been keeping up with, so I need to go see the chatter but like for the most part now that we've launched this stuff i think we're ready to close it out as long as we can close off all the open threads that are in it yeah i think they'll need um it sounds like we should be talking gus about what the plan is for a streaming set of results um because we've okay. also started to talk about that in terms of how we were going to proxy dht responses through the indexer um, great I mean, yeah. Do you want to talk about it here or offline? Uh, either way, <laughs> let's see if we have time on this one. We've got an hour. Okay. But I'll let Torfin continue driving. But yeah, maybe we can it's come back to a parking to it. lot or something. Okay. Uh, for, uh, for like, that's the only update I have on my side uh, that I can hey, remember. That's a that's a big update, and it sounds like we're all on the same page now. Thanks, Gus, for. Jumping in, that's super helpful, and we're excited about that over on the, the Network Indexer team. Um, Just one, one other thing I would say, um, we with given all the things that changed with 018, we did not uh, adjust the search delay, um, you know, the, 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 that magic value that's about at one second right now before we hit the indexers in DHT, so that is still as, as, as it was before. Um, we intend to change that with this next release based off of you know updated uh, findings from from probe lab uh, but just so it's clear we didn't make any of those we didn't merge any of those changes 
That's good to know, Steve. I uh, definitely was checking the Grafana dashboard <laughs> as, as soon as I saw this uh, update just to see if uh, we had, had a, a different traffic arrangement going on. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's important. Um, I'll go ahead and jump in with the, the IPNI updates. And Masim will, if you want to jump in on anything, let me know. Um, but we've got the DH store deployed in the dev environment and integrated with um, an end-to-end -end pipeline of uh, privacy-enabled queries. And so Ivan was testing yesterday the implementation, and I think we got a full end-to-end -end, um, response uh, for double hash queries. Um, Ivan or Masi, did you want to add any flavor to that? Uh, Masi, go on. Nothing to add from me. So uh, I want to add something about the IPIP337, but apart from that, the uh, reader privacy sounds good to me. Yeah. Cool. And then um, indexer scalability now has the freezing, uh, the freezing logic deployed in production. Uh, so we're, we're basically fully deployed with our scalability solution. I think coming out of the last meeting, that's kind of an important aspect that we wanted to stress to all the IPFS stewards and the folks over on Bifrost is that the indexer we're, we're very confident has been tested and is scalable and um, we're, we're ready for traffic. And then Masi, you wanted to bring up a topic about IPP, uh, IPIP337? Yep, I think uh, Lydell and Gus are already on it. There was, uh, I'm keen to get the IPIP327 merged, I think, the only thing was to reduce the scope of it, and that is moving output. So I've, I've put up a PR that uh, does that and sorts out lint stuff. So I think once that's merged, hopefully we can merge IPIP 327. After that, I'll copy over Gus's excellent work on the put request, and, and I'll capture it as a separate PR uh, to then further update the IPIP 327. Excellent. That's it. Yeah, we were we were waiting on the release before we merged it, which is basically why it just sat there so long. <laughs> That'll happen. Um, that's primarily the big moves from the indexer team, uh, unless anybody else wants to jump in and drop one on us. Um, <laughs> but that's been a lot of work for us. We've made a ton of progress. We're very excited about it. Um, can anybody from Probe Lab jump in? Uh, oh, so real, real quick, yeah, I know I wasn't at the last meeting. Is there a uh, link to learn more about when we the freezing logic? What we mean by that? Yeah, I will drop that in there. Cool. Uh, Th thanks. I don't have it immediately up, Steve, but I'll ping yeah, you no and I'll, I'll drop it in the notes as soon as we're out for the call. Cool. Um, thanks, so. Yeah. Okay, so on ProBlab's side, um, I've been working on the spec for the double hashing DHT. Um, I included in a link with the preview, so the, let's say, protocol documentation is there. I'm still documenting the rational and so design choices for everything, but basically the protocol is there. Uh, I'll let you know once I open the PR. And We've also been investigating on the DHT slowness along with the, the Kubo stewards, um, investigating on mul yeah multiple um, uh, yeah multiple ways the DHT multiple reasons the DHT could be slow. We're investigating into fleeks uh, servers and also uh, around Gala nodes, among others. And yeah, that's mostly for probe lab. Hey, th thanks. A couple of questions on the double hashing. We still have uh, Chainsafe involved in on contract, right? Um, I think so. I'll have to ask Yanis. Yanis about that. Okay, I was just kind of, like I, I, I'm curious what they have, like what's remaining on their work until their contract is done. Um, obviously, I know getting the IPIP is important, but I'm, I'm curious what the like remaining action steps are for completing this endeavor? So on chain safe side, it would be finishing. So getting the implementation accorded with the, the spec and testing 
everything just to make sure that the double hash and DHT work. And then, uh, so we've discussed last week uh, in Switzerland about the transition. And so there was the upgradable or agile DHT solution that was proposed. But as, as some IPFS steward mentioned, it's a lot of um, implementation work to get it working. So there was a consensus among the people that were there to just fork the DHT for this time and so that we can ship this double hashing um, DHT. And uh, we'll see later for the credible DHT. And yeah, feel free, if you don't agree, feel free to uh, add any comment or reach out to us. Cool, yeah, where, where's the best, I, I'm assuming we did like kind of the pros and cons analysis of that of that decision. Where, where is it, I guess, the best place for someone to read on that and then to comment if they have comments? Um, I'll find a Notion doc and paste it in this document. And, and then also how much do we need to be giving community visibility into this and make sure they have a chance to weigh in? Um, what, what, what do you mean community visibility? Uh, I, mean, I guess other people in the IPFS uh, ecosystem besides us, if the if and when we fork the DHT. Okay, yeah. We're um, not forking the DHT, and we have given a number of talks over the last year about this. So hopefully it's not too much of a surprise. Uh, are there other things you think would be? Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I haven't like thought, I haven't put my head into like, what are the, I, the ramifications of the decision? I just don't know. Like, I guess it, a lot of it depends on how is this going to affect people and so, so yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't have something premeditated. I just want to make sure we've, we've considered those angles. No, that's right. So the content provider will need to republish to both DHT for the transition period. So they will be affected, and we need to communicate with them. Yeah, and the and the server side will need to hold both. Like, it's just going to increase the amount of stuff used in the net, like the amount of resources used by the network, and also you're going to end up with um you're you're going to end up with like a very civil attackable net like as much as the standard dht is civil attackable a network that has like no nodes because you just rolled it out last week is going to be like trivially attackable so deciding what you want to do about that um i will i will give some some brief context which is that we tried doing we'll call it a uh a, a subtle a subtle fork of the DHT around GoIPFS 0.5, uh, where basically we just sort of transitioned all the bootstrappers to the new protocol and all the Hydra nodes. And we're like, hopefully that will be enough to hold the network. Um, and it wasn't, I think partially because the, like the Hydras weren't operational as they were, but also just because you're moving like 10,000 nodes of traffic to like, one set of infra nodes um as a way to like help with that transition and yeah they they tried it was too much and they sort of wound it back and didn't end up doing the fork that way um so it's just yeah something to take into account both both ways have pros and cons okay i think liddell dropped a, a question in there um in the chat about whether or not this would be a separate lib p2p protocol um yeah, yeah it have to be in yes. order to in order to support both existing at the same time we, we may also i don't know how this is going to end up getting implemented but um like if it's just for provider record like I don't know how, how this is going to be getting implemented, but there are other consumers than IPFS of this of the libp2p DHT code. Um, so we may need to like either more obviously separate out the things and like be like, yep, this is the IPFS one. If you want to keep using, you can use it if you want. If you want to use this other one, use the other one. Um, or we'll need to be a little more proactive about communicating with people in the libp2p ecosystem who may not have been paying attention to the IPFS DHT because they like haven't, they don't really care about IPFS problems. <laughs> They're just using 
whatever looks like a DHT implementation off the shelf in libp2p. Yeah, that's right. Like shouldn't stop us from doing any work. It just should, we should make sure we communicate when we're making code changes so that people don't get surprised by them. And so what are the, the best places to communicate? I mean, I would flag that probably on the go lib p2p cad dht repo if that's the place where you're going to be making changes because at that level it's like somebody who's choosing to use that repo as opposed to someone who's invested in a general protocol spec it's just like what implementation do they want to use mm -hmm. yeah makes sense I, i'm and not also sure maybe advertising on the forums yeah PFS discuss yeah that makes sense and i i don't know who would be the best contact for this at libp 2 p these days but there should be we should hopefully have some record like some understanding of which are some of the larger partners or you know blockchains that are like using using libp 2 p cad dht this way mm -hmm. it's definitely a good topic at the libp 2 p community call um like to to surface there because you know that that gets recorded and shared and that'll have a larger uh showing of libp 2 p interested people who also might be able to say or raise or, you know uh, other organizations or groups to be aware of um but i guess, i think the meta point here is you know, like we def like i i want to make i'm a little worried we're underestimating all that's going to be involved to to do this i'm not not trying to slow us down but uh i don't want to get I don't want to go through some one-way doors here or like I don't, or trip on anything that is then going to force us into a bunch of work that we weren't planning on. Um, so like I would say keep moving forward, but I really want to make sure we see the overarching plan of how we are going to execute on this and that we're like aware and bought off on it before we do any, before we pull any of these steps. Yeah, sure. Yeah, anyway, we don't have a timeline yet for the migration, okay. so we won't start communicating before we have a concrete plan. Thanks. Awesome. And then by Frost, I think you're up. Yep. So a couple of things. First of all, we had to uh, downgrade everything back from 018 RC2 the test that we were doing because of this bug report that we had for, it started with gateway response for JSON content not encoded. There's a bug a report in, in Bifrost Infra, but it turned out that that issue, one of the things that was breaking was Kubo CI. Uh, so we basically rolled everything back. We rolled back to 017 until uh, and of course, we rolled back to 017, and then a couple of hours or less after we rolled out, we found that there was a release of 018 with that fix, with the fix for that. So we still have to roll out 018 to the test to the test nodes. Um, we actually did everything except for two collab cluster nodes because if we because of the repository incompatibility, we would have to wipe the repo or convert the repo, which is a big hassle. So we said, you know what? No, let's just leave those two nodes with 018 RC2 until we actually deploy 018. And yeah, George is taking care of deploying uh, 018, hopefully today or perhaps tomorrow, uh, 018 final to the test, to the canary, to the test nodes. Uh, on the other hand, following on from last week when we were talking about um, cost control, I was uh, the cost optimizations. So I made some graphs, and interestingly, we found two very nice dips in cost. The first one coincides to when we updated to Kubo 017 and enabled the resource manager. That, for some reason, re drastically reduced reduced the, band the outgoing bandwidth of Kubo by about 50%. I don't know exactly what happened. Then the, there was another 50% reduction which was when we actually moved from DHT server to DHT client, which is more understandable why it would why that would happen. I really have no idea. Perhaps some of you have some idea why that first dip happened. 
uh, resource manager is probably <laughs> aggressively throttling some outbound traffic of yours. Uh, and we should probably figure out what is throttling and what the impact of it is. Uh, yes. And I actually found that out uh, at the end of last week that 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 we had that big dip because I hadn't graphed this stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. by 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 impact, I mean like what specifically is it throttling? Uh, like yes. what kind of what kind of requests are being throttled, and what's the impact is in the network of that? Is there a way of doing that short of actually uh, digging into the logs and digging and digging and digging and digging into the logs? Uh, well, as far as I know, logs is the way to do it. Uh, I mean, that, there are some like things that report there. There are some like commands that report stuff out. But my understanding is that the Bifrost nodes all have that functionality turned off, basically because they didn't they didn't want to they didn't they didn't want to have the cost associated with like doing all the metrics recording. Is it the bandwidth metrics? Time. Yeah, the bandwidth metrics thing. Yeah. I actually enabled that a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So that that you... might help you gain a limited view at what's going on mm. uh, without There's... doing all the log digging. There's also okay. Prometheus metrics, I believe, that are on by default for resource manager that will give you an idea of yeah. okay. what's being throttled. Where can I find which metrics the, those are, if possible? I mean, otherwise, I can just you know browse through all the metrics that are there. But yeah, they, they, have they, the... they have the they have the prefix RCMGR on them. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, two two things. So yeah, there are the uh, Prometheus metrics. I was under the impression that we had actually I thought we had disabled those um, for Bifrost because they aren't implemented in a performant way until a new Golib P2P release oh. goes out. And so I thought we had disabled them in your case, um, but maybe that's where I guess, or I know you, I guess or what, I, mean, I might be mixing up that we just did that with the Hydras. So sorry, I, I'm not positive I turned them off on the Hydras. I'm not sure if they're, yeah, I, 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 as last time I remember that they were on by default in Kubo and I don't think we changed that, but I'll go they are, check. Yeah, I think they are by default. The other thing is you can run a stats command to or swarm, I guess it's it's in the doc. I'm trying to forget, but you can basically ask what limits are like exceeding ninety percent, and that might give you a hint okay. of what is uh, you know, of, of what's triggering, of what's being dropped. Okay. Good. Hopefully, we will not. It's not something that we will have to undo because. It's very nice having to having been uh, using up seventy five percent less bandwidth than we used to. Yeah, that would be I, very I very nice. I haven't poked too much into the bandwidth stuff since since last time, mostly because uh, efforts been going into some of the other things with the moving gateway traffic to Saturn, which will give us mm -hmm. a number of benefits, but mostly that we get to like write binaries and code that are specifically optimized for running a public gateway which is like yeah yes yeah <laughs> finally yes. uh and so instead of chasing down like what happens when we what happens when we take the desktop node and like max out all the resources we can we can kind of just build the thing that is useful here yeah or you know we could always just use iro which is kind of built for that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't maybe. think these are pro I, these these problems are usually not problems with Go. They are problems with protocols. Yeah. Or, or no, no, no. implementations <laughs> where you're not paying attention to certain constraints. But I mean, the the point is either way yeah. to like be able to optimize for what we're doing here, which is yeah. then we can exactly. watch the numbers on the graphs, whether they're on the bifrost graphs or the Saturn graphs, and like <laughs> do do what needs yeah. to be done there. Yeah. A, a question cool. on uh yeah agreed on that idea a question on the on the graph so is this this is uh by frost's equinox bend globally per day yes this is a by frost uh global bandwidth spend red is kubo blue is the load balancers yellow is total and there's a link to the to the there's a link somewhere above here with these to the spreadsheet where this where I copy and pasted this one. Okay, great, thanks.
All right. Have you so, noticed any performance? Were there any performance changes that came during the like TTFB changes that came during these or during the big dips in bandwidth cost or nothing that you noticed particularly? Nothing that I noticed. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bifrost. So we threw up a couple topics to cover specifically from the concerns of the content routing perspective. Um, it looks like y'all are kind of already jumping in, but um, first top of mind was the DHT expiry of 24 hours potentially resulting in uh, or probably resulting in 60 times provides to gets ratio. Thanks, Guillaume, for um, adding some reading material there. I'll go back and read that. Um, I don't know if, Will, if you've seen that one yet. Cool. Uh, yeah, sorry. So that's a um, request for measurement that Mikkel, one of our collaborators, wrote on. Um, analyzing the liveliness of the provider record. So how much time they stay in the, in the DHT before they, they expire. Looks like we got a little homework to do. Um, we'll follow up on that. Thanks, Guillaume. I mean, that's that's useful measurement data. I think the the thing that has we've been thinking about from the IPNI side that's been a conversation uh, for a while on on this subject, right, is the the current delegated routing API uh, mirrors the implicit DHT behavior because that was the simplest thing to do, right? Like there's a bunch of code in Kubo as it exists that republishes every 12 hours and expects implicit um, implicitly that records will expire from the DHT in 24 hours. That doesn't need to be what the delegated routing um, API behavior is, right? And, and the indexers uh, use uh, a different uh, mechanism, a different scheduling here where you say, I have this, and then it's on you, the publisher, to say when you no longer have it. And so we just take it that we don't have a TTL implicitly there. It's just, it stays there as long as you as a publisher are alive. Um, and so, um, we, we could figure out whether we want to say that um, we want some amount of like republishing interval um, for delegated routing, um, but maybe we also just want the, the, the stream deltas or a way to like get the current one as a snapshot. Um, there, there's different things that we could do that, that could allow us to both uh, to either sync or reduce the noise of having to do that daily republish. Um, and so I think, uh, Yvonne, you were working on uh, thinking through what what might make more sense on the delegated routing API uh, in terms of the publish side? Uh, yeah. So basically, if we've had uh, any idea about uh, seed groupings, how they relate to each other, so that we can group them into the ads uh, with groupings that make sense, because right now they kind of expire randomly, that results into like, I don't know, sometimes 70% of the advertisements that were generated for the snapshots being like, removed and then re-advertised again because one seed expired from that bunch. Uh, like another thing, obviously, uh, good optimization would be if we, if Kubo could, uh, uh, if IPFS now could explicitly tell uh, the diffs, like what has been added, what, what has been removed instead of like publishing the snapshots. Um, yeah, so these are like two things that I primarily had in my mind. So it's about changing a delegated routing interface to allow different republish methods. Or publish methods, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I guess change is maybe an interesting thing here because we don't have anyone really publishing from IPFS in production. We've got a couple like sample things, but there's not wide use or anything. So it, it's really figuring out the right one. I think we're still very much in experimental phase of, of what what we want that to be designed as. I think we don't have it in the initial IPIP even. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks, Tomasi. Makes sense. 
So just uh, so make sure I understand. So when you say API here, do you mean the HTTP API? Do you mean the Go APIs? What the yeah. HTTP API. And and the issue is that they're not. I'm sure, like I'm trying to understand what's what's the specific issue with the puts. Uh, I think there's two things. One is where we realize that we aren't conveying any particularly useful semantics that the Kubo node or that the IPFS node knows about in how we send out these things. It's it's just that there's a periodic every 12 hours, you know, uh, announcement iterating through all the keys, but you don't know which ones are part of the same pin or are grouped or any of that behavior. So you can't say, I'm going to actually say that these are likely to expire together um, because none of that information uh, gets conveyed. And then secondly, is that we, the schedule of this is just the implicit one that happened to come out of the DHT. Um, and so, you know, we have sidecars that just translate where they have to watch and implement the DHT's 12 hour uh, implicit expiry. I thought you guys were working around that with basically like allowing the the callers like the caller could give you an advisory TTL and the server could tell you, but this is what my actual TTL is. Uh, so, as far as I know, that is not used on either side. But but that 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 as far as I know, the Kubo does not either provide that nor respond to the server one. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm trying to make sure I understand like the. There, there's, I guess, like, and then maybe these things aren't as different as I want them to be, but there's like the API of like what makes sense for if one were writing a client from scratch that was maybe sometimes using this for the DHT and sometimes using this for IPNI, what would be enough to make it happy? And then there's like, how do we want to, how could we mess around with Kubo internals to make it like work well with this situation? I think um, I think this is the what 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 would a reasonable change in Kubo internals be that would allow us to make other providers that are reasonable that are efficient. Yeah. Okay. I I suspect that that kind of thing is going to be like kind of painful in that you probably want and and there are good reasons to do this anyway but it probably means like adding a separate key value store database table whatever you want to call it that has like here's a list of all the things i'm advertising and some tags for them that allows me to track them and do ads and removals as you'd want for ipni and are probably useful for dht things too because then i could like have an index that sorts them by their place in key space so I can do puts appropriately. Um, but that's like, yeah, doing, doing like doing that's like not super trivial fun work for someone, um, can be, can be done. Uh, but like, yeah, I guess I'm trying to separate out some of like the Kubo internal pieces from like the API pieces. Because the API pieces may be much easier for some of the partners that are getting blocked by this to work with. Um, although, like, if we need to do it in Kubo, it can be done there too. It's just, I'm just trying to, I, if possible, I'm trying to separate out these into two different pieces so we don't, uh, we don't get one, we don't get having an API that is usable by anyone else blocked by internal Kubo refactors. So that, that makes sense to me on the surface, Adin. I mean, ultimately, I mean, the, the, I'm assuming the right way to do this is someone needs to drive the, the put right side of the HTTP delegated uh, routing API. The stuff we've kind of, we've pulled out that needs to get someone's got to take the lead on you know starting up a new IP for that and that's where some of these questions will get answered uh and ideally we get the spec nailed down and and then we can enable different implementations to go after it I must be so I guess who who yeah. we, we will to, we will at can, some point propose a spec I think we also see this as something where what we're worried on is that it's going to take a long time for anyone to get to the inside of Kubo and we don't have any other clients that are going to 
uh, make active use of this. So this is really a when we get to it, and it's relatively low down our priority list as as far as I can tell. Would an would an easier one to get that like shares some similarities, but seems much easier to do be to land like Mossy's nom spec and then do IPNS puts because then we at least have sure, but that's totally different from the from the provides right they, like these are both things that need to get done well they're 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 different but it's like it's similar they both have different rights and different TTLs so you're dealing with that but you're not dealing with the large grouping behavior so you're sort of nailing like two out of three I think that was that was the only reason I I, I brought it up. Like it, it just moves us a little closer. Yep. I think the stuff that Ivan probably looked at today, uh, and we'll talk about, it, for me, sounds like deep changes in the protocol because right now the entire protocol talks uh, as talks about SIDs as atomic units, right? All you have is I provide this SID, I no longer provide this SID. I, I, sorry, I provide this with this TTL and it expires and goes away. Uh, the problem comes when you have a huge amount of SIDs, which means the churn in providing, the churn in um, using SID as an atomic unit increases significantly, right? So the way that IPNI has been dealing with this is you have this concept of diff. So rather than re-advertising everything, you just say add one, remove two, add seven, right? And then on top of that, you have some, you have a grouping which is called context ID that allows you to then change character, uh, retrieval to characteristics of a whole group of states without having to re-advertise anything, right? So for example, you can say of all the things that I've advertised in the past without telling me what you've advertised, uh, you could say that, hey, I now support BitSwap, right? I no longer support BitSwap, right? So these are the like flexibility that IPNI provides. The, the, ideally, we would like the similar uh, flexibilities in IPFS because we want to be more efficient about advertising the SIDs and so on. And that's for, that, to me, sounds like something that requires deep changes down to, you know, lip to p interfaces, like, right? for example, content routing interface, peer routing interface, things like that, right? Separate to that, we, want, we also want to change the HTTP delegated routing APIs to do this. I don't think this change is going to happen over time. So iteratively, uh, we should probably think of uh, interfaces that enable the existing IPFS to work first, uh, like the put stuff that uh, Gus wrote, for example. And then we can think of improvements on top of that, which then enables um, extra things that IPNI provides natively within code delegated routing. Does, so does any, sorry for the dumb question here, does any team right now have a user use case that is really pushing on this work to get it done? I, yeah, I try to phase, where is this on the priority stack for anybody to move forward? My, my guess is that the, uh, the main like push here would be if someone decided that it was easier it was easier for us to do this internally and then ship it out in Kubo to get Pinata and Fleek to like advertise their data than to just convince them to like run 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 the sidecar, run like the the scraping daemon that lets them do this. Cause they all have their own internal databases with lists of CIDs anyway. Like they could probably just run a little go daemon that does the IPNI thing that doesn't need any of this. Um, but thus far, those conversations, my understanding is they have not, they have not progressed particularly far. Um, so I, my, that's my suspicion of where you would run into like, where is the user demand for this? Unless anyone's got something else on their mind. I agree with Adin. I think lack of use cases is, is, you know, the reason there's no use cases for it is because, you know, it's been a difficult area and nobody's bothered solving it. I think this is something that has high multiplier impact. So if you make it easier, we would have more content available. Everything moves up. It, it also happens to be that like, if you, if you tackle some of these things sort of have been in the background wanting to happen for a long time. 
like I think Andrew started on like the basics of this when he re redid how the pinning worked internally in in Kubo, but um, the fact that there's no like list of like here are the objects I'm advertising and what do I know about how they're advertising, um, sort of hurts you because even with the DHT stuff you have no way of figuring out like what's been advertised recently and what's not, right? There's just like a did it all happen? I hope so. When I did the probe for IPFS DHT find probs, this CID, my thing came back. So I guess that looks good. Um, so so we've, you know. we, we should probably move on since we've already agreed that this isn't super high priority, um, that, that we're not going to design a single thing here. And we've got some other topics in the last 15 minutes. Well, we can jump over the... Um... We'll, we'll, we'll keep this going for content routing in the future. I think it's a, an important topic. I'll probably summarize it. And those that were here to, to be a part of this will remember what we're talking about. And uh, if we have to bring new parties into the mix as we reprioritize efforts, we can, we can do that. Um, well, we basically entirely covered this better estimate choosing expiry for yep. delegated provides. Yep, that's part of the previous one, I think. Yeah. Um, one thing that I think came up was, uh, so I guess we didn't actually, um, roll out on the, the gateways without testing, did we, uh, or no. Did... And, and I think this is a different topic, right? This is, this yeah. was the removing of delay, which got punted back to point 19. And yeah. so again, I think it's, uh, for the point 19, do we have a plan to test with the reduced DHT slash indexer delays on the gateways before tagging the final release? Uh, yes, we do. So Ian will test on um, Thunderdome. I think the plan is that he will be able to test it this week or probably next, next week, worst case. And then, yeah, provide some benchmark for how it behaves with different uh, provider search delays. I, I guess, so, so I think there's two things, right? There, there's, so, so with, with the modeling and Thunderdome testing, you can say, okay, it's going to cause a 10x increase in queries and it's going to change the delay so much. So you can understand the relative changes in bandwidth and you can understand the relative changes in performance. But what I'm asking here is that we do a rollout on all of our IPFS gateways, which have a bulk of traffic in a rolling deploy that we can roll back before we cut the final tag so that we can tell if we're doing a 20x increase in DHT traffic, is this causing a bunch of the DHT to fall over because it's got too many queries? Okay, yeah, we can do that. But so what we expect to see with this change, so as with the Kubo 018, we've reduced the number of directly connected peers, we're gonna have much less bit swap requests and so with the upcoming change, we're going to have much more DHT requests. But um, so the additional DHT requests are like 100 of uh, the, what we win with the, the a bit of search that we don't make. And so, yeah, the DHT load is expected to increase, but not significantly. But it's, yeah, it's good to test before we actually deploy it. Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I'd be careful just to check on that. It's also, there's a difference between like sending messages and then forming lib P2P connections, um, right? With the bit swap stuff, you're, you're not forming any new connections, you're sending messages. So the things that we're dealing with are, are going to change. May, it may be that all the resources like work themselves out in the end, but uh, yeah, good, good thought, Will. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, it's like, yeah, if you, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you're like the project driver there. Um, so I, I know we've asked to get some extra measurements and comparisons and using Thunderdome for some of that is great. Let's also add in a step for coordinating with Bifrost to do Bifrost deployment um, and then you know make sure we're measuring and reviewing that properly. And then we can get it, you know, that's just a config change on in Bifrost config. And then we can, you know, properly uh, assert what we're going to do and why within the Kubo default config. But I guess we're, we're sure. kind of looking to you to um, drive that coordination with Bifrost on the, the, the deployment, you know, being specific about what you want and making sure that it actually flows all the way through. Yep. Cool. Thank you. All good. I reach out to Bifrost. So after we've done the benchmark. 
Super. Um, we, we didn't talk about this in the decentralized gateway one, but there is some question of if we're having Saturn L1s as retrieving content uh, going and, and trying to uh, query both DHT and indexers, what, what does that look like? Um, I think the, the indexing team is, so, so this uh, I guess goes to Gus's initial update of the ND JSON, which is we expect, we've got this HTTP API, we're gonna need to update it somehow to, because one of the things that we expect is that the latency of an index response versus a DHT response are going to be different. So you don't want to wait for all of your results to be collected and return a single response. You'd like to be able to have a couple of different responses at different times. Um, Gus, what can can you say a little bit more about what you were expecting that ND JSON looks like? Uh, it's basically exactly the same as the current one, except that it's it is uh, each JSON object is streamed out. Is a new line, new line delimited JSON. Uh, so and, right now it's also like the, the code that itself return, right? will be broken. So, so you, sorry, go ahead. Right now it's an array of things that you get back essentially. Right. And so instead right? of an array, you'd get new line delimited JSON objects. Uh, and you'd have to request in JSON as the uh, as an ex content in your type. accept header. Yeah. Um, and the server would need to respond with the right content type. And the 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 client and server code itself in libipfs would would require an AP, a breaking API change, but I don't think that's that big of a deal. Uh, right now they return slices, you can't return slices if you're streaming results, so. Because this is the same as the old reframe protocol, the streaming thing you're talking about, right? Yeah, it's very similar, yeah. Well, right, hopefully it won't have a trailing new line at the end of it. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I guess the only other thing, uh, Masi and Ivan, you maybe have thoughts on in your head is, is that just gonna work with, uh, like, will we be able to do the same thing on double hashed queries? Or is there any other thought that we're going to put in when we have both of those happening in parallel? I don't see any issues with it. Uh, I mean, it, it depends on the body of JSON. So, so right now, the double hash response is encrypted results and then list of bytes, basically. Uh, as long as we could return like partial, multiple encrypted results with multiple list of bytes, then I don't see why it wouldn't work. Cool. Uh, we will wait for the IPIP Gus or the code change each other way and uh, ping us and we're happy to review. Does that work? Yep, sounds good. Uh, and I, I guess uh, Masi or Ivan, we should file an issue on index star to track that rollout of supporting the new format as well as the current one. Yep. And I, like I know Gus has already, Gus already has some code on this. Uh, what's the code? collective priority on this like is this something we need to make sure gets landed this month particularly as it, as it might affect the decentralized gateway work yeah there needs my to understanding be is no point. because it's going to be lassie likely as the client um which will be able to support a streaming thing and so we don't need to roll out to clients of ipfs so we're not blocking on like an ipfs release schedule for this or kuba release schedule but we still need like we can get the code done, but we're not... yeah we still need the code to like be in go live ipfs or wherever right yeah or which... have to it, the api change that does both hand you know handles ndjson and then gives us like a channel instead of a slice um for returned results What I'm hearing you say is like that's that's code that should be in uh, libipfs. Lassie may be the delivery vehicle, which is depending on libipfs for this functionality. 
And if we're too least. slow, then we'll just copy and paste it. And La Lassie it. already is doing a direct HTTP query, and and I, I think that's that's fine, right? I'm going to let Hannah figure out how she wants to query yeah. indexers. Okay, sure. So so no need for the so they can do whatever they want for the Go interfaces, but the uh, I guess but we need to land the ND JSON in the server side code. Well, I think yeah, I don't the server side is not used by uh, index the indexers either. They they don't use the by PFS for this. They okay. just have their own implementation. Yeah. So it, it's as it's it's for ongoing compatibility with IPFS because uh the the worry is an IPFS Kubo client queries indexer. We've got DHT results we could return, and are we going to delay because they're still asking us for us the non-streaming variant? I think the answer is we wouldn't delay, and we and until we get ND JSON accept headers, we just won't. We'll, we'll give the fastest results only uh, on the SID contact endpoint. Okay, so you just have some like internal timeout, and then just like after that time, you just send what you got. Uh, I think maybe even it's if if we get a request not oh, for any JSON, we say, well, this is probably Kubo and not Saturn, and they'll figure out the DHT themselves. So we're going to only query our direct local database. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Are is there any worry here about uh, having the CID.contact return DHT results with like as if and have it be transparently the same as if they were like other IPNI results. Um, that being confusing when you're like, so should I, you know, I'm in Australia, should I use these picnic people? Um, but then like, oh, actually they have different results than CID.contact does. Explain what the difference is. So like, uh, right now, like if I could accumulate a list of, I don't know, pretend like all the peers listening on the PubSub channel that people are publishing to, I could be like, oh, these are all indexer folk. Uh, and I can query them and they can give me results. And I could just be like, yep, they all seem like they're giving me the same results. I'll go to whoever's closest to me. And mm -hmm. in Australia, I guess that's picnic. Yep. But, but as soon as they're not returning the same results, my ability to do that kind of goes out the window, um, which makes, yeah, which makes the like choosing different indexers or choosing the closest in indexer to me like a harder task than if we just ran this like next to the indexer or something like it, like in the same data center so we don't have to deal with any traffic things and then we put another node in front that's like a combined thing. Like I, I just basically I don't want to hurt IPNI's ability to have like you get to choose from multiple indexers in the future by like I, I, I don't huge, think I don't you know. think extra results is going to be a huge problem. We're still working on the consistency like validation or cross validation story still to a point where we're, there's no clients that are doing this uh, at this point. Okay. Like you want to have more. Like this is this is good, and so the the end result is if this gets built, all indexers would be incentivized to also build this or to to run this to to maintain parity, and that seems probably fine. Dean, I'm going to keep that uh, kind of concern in my back pocket just as we're going through the process of these iterations. Um, it's a good point to dwell on. Um, I think next up is this uh, bit swap peers and whether or not there's any way to measure how much gateway content currently is not in the DHT or the indexers. Does anybody know the answer to that? I don't know if probe lab folks have any has anyone measured this yet stuff uh, sorry well, what's the question so the yeah. so it's sort of this contrapositive and and maybe some uh, explicit measurements on the gateways at some point might be interesting here which is there's some periods where 
we do resolve on BitSwap to connected peers from the gateways. But if we were to then go and query the DHT or query the indexers for that SID, we wouldn't find any providers for it because it's providers that are only publishing their root. And so if you actually then ask for a sub item, it's not in the DHT, it's just only there because you're hopefully already connected to them. Or some cases like Pinata and Fleek where they don't publish any of their content. And it's that they've maintained passive BitSwap connections with gateways that they're able to return it over the gateways. So one of the questions we have is if we go to a DHT slash uh, indexer primary content routing and don't have consistently open BitSwap things or if the number of gateways expands, how much content do we lose that's in this sort of degenerate case? Um, and we don't have a good sense of how much of that content uh, it is in terms of the number of requests against the gateways currently. And I think there's two different pieces of this. Um, one is the, we'll call them like long, like peering connections, right? Um, whether it's the ones that we know about and are hard coded from our side or for for other reasons, we have listed our peer IDs on the docs.ipfs.tech website and other people have hard coded peering to us as like, uh, I guess, and yeah, that, so they're doing it that way, right? Um, which is basically just repeatedly connecting to us no matter how many times we disconnect from them um, as a feature. Uh, and so th there's like, those are the persistent peering connections, which is different from what we'll call like shorter term peering. Like I only advertise, you know, or you happen to connect to me because you advertised some of the data and then over the course of the connection, I pulled all of it and I should have advertised all of it, but I didn't. And that was good enough. Um, the reason I think separating those is, is somewhat important is that uh, the, the big persistently connected peers, like we can do something about uh, and the smaller ones, it's, it's kind of like, it's just sort of hit or miss. It's um, so you want to be focused on like the big, like the hard coded peering agreement ones. So I'm just going to jump in. Uh, we've, we've run our course and we've got one minute left to draw. Um, any last minute urgent top of minds from anybody in the group before we, before we bail? If not, uh, as usual, I'll create a summary of this discussion posted in the content routing work group. Um, capture any action items associated with the discussions that have happened and kind of communicate them out to everybody. Thanks everyone for joining. This is super productive and helpful. Uh, really appreciate all your contributions. Thanks, Torfin. Yeah. Have a great afternoon or, or morning or evening, wherever you're at. Take care. Thanks, Torfin. Take care. Thank you.